Hi, how are you doing? This is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com. And today, I want to talk about the five ways that alcohol might be trashing your sex life. That's coming up. Firstly, thank you very much if you subscribe to my YouTube channel. I understand we crossed 16,000 subscribers today, which is fantastic. Thank you very much. If you're not yet a subscriber, please do it now. And don't forget to like and comment, and I'll give you my very best advice and information on there. My quit drinking boot camps that I take around the world, just to remind you, Nashville is coming up, but it's pretty much sold out. I think we have one place left, uh, but it's probably going to be gone by the time you get to the website. So Toronto is next up, 31st of March, 2019. Uh, then we got Sydney, Australia on the 28th of April, and we're hoping to come back to London, England in May, June, 2019. So for details on that, and also the free quit drinking webinar that I do every day, go to stopdrinkingexpert.com. So just before we get onto the subject, um, I got a couple of emails from people this week that I haven't answered yet. So I thought I'd throw it in on the video here. Simon, if you've emailed me asking about alcohol in food, you know, in like desserts and in mouthwash and things like that. I'm going to try and answer your question at the end of the video. Uh, Martin, you emailed me about the kick. I'll explain all about that towards the end as well. Okay. So five ways that alcohol may be trashing your sex life. And the first one is short term impotence, short term erectile dysfunction. And I get a lot of emails from guys. And they always go in a very set pattern, these emails. A guy will email me. He will tell me the problem <laughs> that he's uh, not able to get it up. He's not able to perform or he's not able to last long enough. Then he will tell me that he will give me some uh, plausible deniability. Is it because I'm middle aged now? Is it because my underwear is too tight? And then he'll throw in at the end. Or could it be my drinking? And I think, you know, the undercurrent here is he's desperate for me to say, yeah, definitely not your drinking guy. Probably those, un those underpants, get those changed. Unfortunately, I, I speak from experience on this because at the peak of my drinking, this was a problem for me. In fact, for three years of my first marriage, at the peak of my drinking, my wife and I were in separate bedrooms because there was no point as being in the same bedroom. You know, I was in a drunken coma by 8 p.m. every evening, so I'd just go to the spare room. My wife would, you know, she'd stay up a, to a bit more of a normal time with the kids and she'd go to her bedroom. But I'll be honest with you, and I have spoken very frankly and honestly about this in the past, even if we had shared a bedroom, even if I'd wanted something to happen, I wouldn't have been able to do it. And I think I just avoided sex so I wouldn't have to consider that. I avoided sex so I wouldn't have to consider that if I want to have sex, I have to stop drinking. Because at that point in my drinking career, that was unthinkable. So the truth is, alcohol's effect on the circulation and on the blood vessels is such that it dilates them, makes them wider. And, you know, if you have a certain amount of fluid and you push it through a wide pipe, it comes out slower, doesn't it? What you want is tight, constricted tubes to give you the pressure that you need to perform. So I'm really sorry about this. But if you're starting to notice that you can't get it up or you can't sustain it long enough and you're drinking on a regular basis, there is a very good chance it is because of alcohol. Number two, long term Impotence, long-term erectile dysfunction. For most people, and myself included, when you stop drinking, the problem goes away. Like, like so many other things, health-related. You know, when I was a drinker, I, was, I had high blood pressure. I had sleep apnea. Um, I had a pain in my abdomen that was just continuously there, wouldn't go away. And I also had... Uh, erectile dysfunction. Within three months of quitting drinking, my blood pressure returned to normal levels. I lost 57 pounds in weight without even trying. Uh, my, that pain in my side disappeared. And suddenly, sex 
was on the menu again, and it hadn't been for such a long time. So for most people, when you stop drinking the poison, the problem goes away. But for some heavy drinkers, if you're drinking really heavily on a daily basis and you have been doing for a sustained amount of time, there is a very strong chance that you will have long lasting extended impotence. And this isn't just, you know, a slight chance of you getting this. The figures are quite shocking. You know, you show me someone who's been abusing alcohol on a very heavy basis for a long period of time, their chances of having erectile dysfunction are somewhere around 70, 75 percent. I mean, what I'm saying is you're pretty much guaranteed impotent if you abuse alcohol that heavily for that long. And that's, I mean, you know, this is where you're, you get to the point in your life where you've, you've, you're basically saying, I have chosen alcohol over sex. And you never want to be in that situation. That's just, why would, you're choosing to drink poison rather than have sex. That's a terribly warped and twisted place to be. All right, number three, pressure on your relationship. If there is pressure on your relationship, your sex life will suffer. It's a no brainer, isn't it? And the pressure comes in many different ways and from many different sources. For a start, I always say to people at boot camp, especially people who come as a couple, is if you're in a relationship with a problem drinker, then there are three people in your relationship. Because your husband, your wife, is not always going to put you first. Sometimes, and sometimes more often than not, they're going to put alcohol before you. And again, I speak from experience because back when I was drinking, you know, I wouldn't go anywhere unless I could drink. So if my wife wanted to go somewhere and I found out you couldn't drink there, then I'd just refuse. I said, I'm not going. If my kids wanted to go to do some activity and you couldn't drink, then I wouldn't go. I would come up with a compromise where I could drink and they could do something. And what happens then is you, you get a situation where nobody's happy. The kids are not happy, your husband, your wife's not happy, you're not even really happy because you're having to compromise on what you want to do, which is drink. So you have a third person in your relationship. Getting into this sort of problem, it's almost as bad as having an affair because you're not looking after your partner, you're not giving them the love, care and attention that they deserve and you're thinking about someone else the evil clown of alcohol addiction that lives in your head. But also, of course, alcohol introduces infidelity, cheating, and lying. You know, I, I talk about this at boot camp, how I would always drink, I, was always ha I would always have two bottles of wine a night, but on the second bottle, I would always tip away the last inch, the last couple of centimeters of wine. I was always, always throw it down the sink. Why? I did that purely so I could lie to my wife with plausible deniability. Every night my wife would say to me, did you drink two bottles of wine again? And I could say, no, 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 no. I drank one, but I didn't finish the second. I mean, <laughs> it, you know, and, how many times have you lied to your partner about how much you've, you've drank? And so when you start bringing lies and deceit into a relationship, the pressure builds. And then you get into the areas of cheating and infidelity. Uh, and this is not just, you know, people who are not committed to their relationship, people with questionable morals. R some really beautiful, good relationships have been destroyed by this drug because of the way it works on the brain. You know, the first thing alcohol does when it gets into your body is it goes straight to the brain and it locates the part of your brain responsible for making sound and logical decisions and it switches it off. And so you may love your wife or your husband and suddenly someone's hitting on you and you make the wrong decision and it destroys your relationship. Now the reason alcohol does this, it doesn't, doesn't want you to cheat, it doesn't care whether you cheat. It does this to take control away from you as to whether you drink another drink. Because all problem drinkers start in the same routine. Drinking starts in the same routine for everyone. I'll just have one drink. 
just to help me relax. I'll just have one drink just to help me socialize. I'll just have one drink. You know, nobody ever in, in this situation goes, I'll just have a whole bottle of vodka. Yeah. It always starts with the premise of I'll just have one. And so this drug is so devious and insidious. The first thing it does when it gets into your body is it goes into your brain and turns off that part of your brain that made that decision to just have one. And that's why I say to my members that you'll only ever get one decision, the first drink. Every other drink after that will not be decided by you. It will be decided by the evil clown that lives inside your head. So that's why this drug puts so much pressure on relationships, which can't help but damage your sex life and your intimacy. Number four is a bit weird, but there's some logic to it. Smoking. A lot of people who drink also smoke at the same time. They're kind of anchored together. They're linked psychologically in, a, in the smoker and the drinker's brain because you've done them in the same environment so many times. It's become a psychological program like Ivan Pavlov and his dogs. You know the story? He would ring that bell and the dogs would salivate even if no food was available. So oftentimes when a smoker smokes, they also get an urge to drink. And when a drinker drinks, they get an urge to smoke and the two are linked together. Now you might be thinking, well, what's that got to do with sex life, Craig? And it, it's, like, um, it's, it's like you create the perfect storm by doing this because the single biggest cause of impotence, of erectile dysfunction is cigarette smoking. <coughs> Excuse me. The second biggest cause of erectile dysfunction is alcohol. So if you smoke and you drink, you're basically guaranteed impotence. And because the two kind of feed each other, you, you create this cycle. So it gets even worse. So that's why drinking is especially bad if you're also trying to kick a smoking habit and at the same time you're seeing problems in your sex life as well. The fifth and final one for the, the video today is STIs, STDs, sexually transmitted disease. Um, I mean, alcohol pretty much wrote the book on unprotected sex. It's quite scary when you look at the stats on this. It's something like 70, 80 percent of sexual assaults and rape involve alcohol in some form. Something like 60% of unplanned pregnancies involve alcohol in some form. And so we don't need to linger on this point because it's obvious, isn't it? You drink, it makes you do things, it makes you do stupid things. And that includes in your sex life as well. You do things that you wouldn't normally do. You do things that are screamingly bad for you. And often with these sort of mistakes, you only get a chance to make them once and then that's it. So let's not linger on that. But that's my five reasons why alcohol can be trashing your sex life. So before we wrap up today, let me answer a couple of emails. Um, Simon uh, is doing the online course, doing great with it. Uh, he's just getting a little bit nervous about what if he accidentally consumes alcohol, like in food. You get desserts like tiramisu, uh, where the sponge is soaked in brandy and things like that. Um, mouthwash and those sorts of things. It's a great question, Simon. Um, it's probably better if I break it into parts. Food cooked with alcohol is fine because the alcohol evaporates in the cooking process. So if you go to a restaurant and you see chicken in white wine, don't panic, don't worry. 99% of the alcohol will have evaporated in the cooking process. Now, if you're having a dessert like a sherry trifle or a tiramisu, then I would advise avoiding it. It's not a disaster. If you put it in your mouth and you taste it, it's not like you, you're immediately going to drop straight back into the loop of drinking that you had before. Just recognize when you taste it and leave it. Give it to someone else because it may not trigger a relapse, 
you may not even like it. You may be at the point where you've, you've, de you've developed so far along the course that now alcohol just repulses you. And whenever you smell it or you taste it, you just think of that decaying discharge that comes out of vegetable matter when you let it rot, because that's all alcohol is. And once you get that kind of mindset, then alcohol just repulses you. The smell of it, it's like, oh, how did I used to drink that? So if you're, the, if you're at that point, once you detect it in the food, just, just leave it. It's probably the best thing. Um, mouthwash and things like that. Well, look, there are alternatives. There, there, are, there is alcohol-free mouthwash. You don't have to use the alcohol. Uh, and in fact, why would you? When we know for a fact, it's been proven that alcohol causes mouth cancer. So I'm, I'm not even sure why we choose to use alcohol as mouthwash. Um, so you're probably better off switching anyway. Hope that helps, Simon. Uh, Martin emailed me saying, um, can you explain what the kick is? Yes, Martin. I break alcohol addiction down into three stages. You've got the first stage, which is what I call the kick. This is where the drug has a physical effect on your body. It's you know when you get home from work at the end of the day and you've got that sensation, oh, I'm so stressed, oh, I could do with a drink. Most of the time, that is not the thing that you label it as being. It is the kick. It is the withdrawal from the drug. This is how alcohol motivates us to keep drinking, by using carrot and stick. So what it does is it makes you feel uncomfortable and then it rewards you by taking away the discomfort for a short period of time. So you get home from work and you feel stressy. Oh, what a day I had. Oh, I could do with a drink. This is, the, this is the drug applying pressure onto your body, onto your central nervous system. And you incorrectly label it as something else. The, my boss is an asshole. I can't believe how many bills I've got to pay. The kids are playing up. We label it what seems most obvious to us. And then we drink and the sensation of stress dissipates, goes away. And again, we incorrectly make an assumption. We incorrectly say, ah, the alcohol made my stress go away. Not true. Al the only thing alcohol did there was reward you for complying. It gave you pain and then took it away as a reward. It did not affect your stress. That's just how it kind of felt. And that's how this devious, nasty little drug keeps people trapped in a loop where they're drinking for an entire lifetime sometimes. Now, the kick is a process that lasts up to 14 days. After 14 days, the drug no longer has any physical power over you. You're purely into the next phase of the process, which is what I talk about in the course as psychological addiction. Pavlovian conditioning. The fact that for the last 10 years, you've connected alcohol with relaxation. You've connected alcohol with socializing, alcohol with sleeping, alcohol with confidence, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in the course, I show you how to break that down. So Martin, just to summarize, the kick is the physical effect of the drug on the body. It lasts for the first 14 days. If you drink at any point during that 14 days, the kick begins again. You don't go back a day, you go back right to the start and you start the 14 day process over again. Okay, I really hope that helps. Thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, if you'd like to join me for a free quit drinking webinar, go to the website right now, stopdrinkingexpert.com. Thanks a lot, see you in the next one. so insistent that this has to be difficult to deal with. And I'm excited to be here today to show you that simply isn't true. It can be dealt with simply, quickly, and without willpower.
We live in a bubble of unreality with this drug. It's the only drug that when you get a problem with it, they blame you and not the drug. That doesn't happen with any other substance. Repeatedly drinking a highly addictive substance and getting addicted should not be seen as some weird outcome or that you're a freak. It should be seen as the entirely logical conclusion of your actions. Oh.